Playoff contenders in Seattle and what might not be an elimination match. Quarterbacks who are built for this moment. Overreaction to clock management and when questions get sideways. This is the College Game Day podcast for Wednesday, October 11th. Reese Davis and Pete Thamel here. Uh, Pete, we're going to talk plenty, especially with our friend Bill Connolly when he comes along about Oregon and Washington. And I certainly don't want to bury the lead. But I think one of the one of the things we try to do on this podcast is to give our listeners some insight into just how weird both of us are about this sport, probably in general, but particularly about this sport. So last night, Tuesday night football, what's better than that? There was three games on, a three box on YouTube TV. And you know what? I, I have the YouTube TV endorsed by Jim Harbaugh, but not a paid sponsor, I believe. And I foolishly was not using the three box because I gravitated to the Jacksonville State game because of Rich Rodriguez and because of the last two Jacksonville State games that I've watched wow. ended up being theater of the absurd. So thankfully, you alerted me to the great finish that was happening in the Coastal Carolina Appalachian State game via text. And then uh, you all, you like to say, and you're right, that we don't root. But then I started openly rooting against Coastal Carolina, not to win or lose the game, but not to win the game the way that they did. <laughs> they were going in for a go-ahead touchdown and perhaps an overreaction to the Miami debacle, in which, by the way, Coastal was not ahead. Guy has an open touchdown and, and stops on the one-yard line, so now they've got to snap it a couple more times. So I'm texting to you, you know what? I'm sorry to feel this way, but I want him to miss the field goal because I I'm not a I'm not a fan of that. Do you did you think that was a good play? Come around on this, Reese. So we could call this the Daquan Finn play. Do you remember when Toledo had Notre Dame on the ropes? Uh, Daquan Finn is Toledo's quarterback, led him to the MAC title last year. They were in South Bend. It was a fourth and like you know, eight to 12 type play, not like a goal line fourth, you know, where you're shoving the quarterback's butt like everybody does now. And he busts out uh, around the edge and runs for a touchdown with like a minute and change left. And uh, I don't remember if it was a, a one point game, three point, but like the analytic play there would have been now, again, I, this is not even any slight shade on Daquan Finn because uh, it wasn't like they let him do it. He earned, he earned the play to go do it. And, I don't believe they were up. So to go take a touchdown to take the lead at Notre Dame isn't, isn't a bad, you know, is not a bad play, but it left time on the clock. Notre Dame marched down one and nobody's ever thought about that game again. And so I really feel like I have seen enough. And I thought I texted you this back and I didn't see it on there. Like it was, it was a win for the analytic guy in the double, double wide glasses in the book <laughs> on the sideline. That was a win. Last night was a win for them because it went exactly how it should it's like in blackjack, you split on this and you hit on this. And then when it goes, you're like, oh, okay, that's what the odds say. And the odds say to do that. And I, I, so again, do I cheer for it and want it? No. But did I say, you know what? That's a pretty smart play. The game's tied. I might've felt different if they were down. The game's tied. They drained the clock. They ate their timeouts and they, you know, it was a clinical NFL style finish. With players who are not clinical NFL players, and right. I, I certainly don't want to throw any shade on uh, Tim Beck's kicker, right? I just don't right. know if he's good or not. But right. boy, boy, on the road, tough place to play too. We've been at that that venue last year for game day. They're, they've had a couple IPAs. They're you know that place is rocking and rolling. Human nature can come in at a you know on a twenty year old in there. So when it left his foot, Reese, I thought it was bad. I thought that thing was making up. You know, it was like one of my drives off the tee. It went like hard right, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it sliced in. Everybody wins, but you were, you were, why were you so offended? Well, you know, the, I think the thing is, Pete, I understand the analytics and I understand reducing the number of plays that someone might get to go against you, but in a, in a tie game and you have a chance to give your team the lead, wouldn't you rather have the lead right then? I mean, we've seen a plethora of bad snaps in college football, across college football this year, shotgun snaps. In fact, I was talking to some people around it, and a lot of it has to do with defensive front centers trying to reach blocks, and they're rushing. They're, you know, maybe there's some communication issues. I just think a lot can go wrong, and I, I'm always a believer sort of in my life that you make a decision based on what you know right now. 
And what you know at the moment is that you can score a touchdown and take the lead. Now, let me offer the caveat. If you're ahead already and then you can kneel out the clock, I'm good with that. If you're ahead one, you there's that is 100% play to go down there. Right. Absolutely. If you have the lead, I'm good with it. So this is not like the Miami thing. They weren't, um, certainly if you're behind, even if a field goal can win, I think you take what's given to you right there and you walk in and score the touchdown. Um, but it it bothers me because it, I don't know, it just seems, <laughs> it doesn't seem to be the right thing to do. From I understand with the analytics that it might say that it is, but from a football standpoint, it doesn't feel right in that situation to to put off taking the lead. It almost falls in line with what we've talked about a couple of times with my belief that coaches are so risk aversive and talk about seizing the moment, and yet often they don't. Uh, Jed Fish with Arizona against USC comes to mind. And that play last night felt like not seizing the moment. Worked out fine for them and good for them. They earned the victory. But there was part of me that said, you know what? Let's just see what happens in overtime. Let's, you know, <laughs> but I, I don't know. It just, it offended my football sensibility, even though, um, you know, I know from an analytical standpoint uh, that it's probably a high percentage play to go ahead and do it. Yeah, you have an old football soul. And I respect that it offends those sensibilities because it's just for the first 50 years that you watched football, the dude ran that in the end zone, mm -hmm. right? And probably won at a pretty high clip, right? It was it was about, it was like one in teens left, something like that when when he went down. Did you I wasn't like locked in on the game. I was watching it obviously, but I wasn't. Did you feel like they let him score? Um, you know, I didn't. I thought about that at the yeah. moment. I mean, it's possible. Yes. Um, you know, I remember um I wish I could remember who they were playing. I remember an Iowa game years ago in which they were down one and they let a guy score. Now, and that that's sort of what we were talking about earlier. That's the right defensive play. It's your only chance to get the ball back, but then it's also the better offensive play not to score there yes. and and let the clock but again different because you're ahead in the tie game i wanted him to take the lead and then i wanted the defense to stop them and and i can ask tim beck this uh the coastal coach like what did the numbers actually say you know what i mean like is do you mm -hmm. get a do you get a thing on the sideline if we score here we have a 92 percent chance to win because it's still a pretty mm -hmm. high chance to win right yeah if we don't score, drain the clock, and have to kick the field goal, like what the percentages say on that. And I guess there's really no hard number you can do on that, right? Um, yeah, so I, I don't – I guess I don't know is the uh, is, is the answer to that. But I'd be curious, like, on the headset, does he have someone who's really guiding the, the, the book and the clock? Some of these guys have, like – you know, especially in the NFL, they have just clock guys, you know, end of end of half – timeouts uh you know and the, those dudes in the nfl do the the challenge flags too the challenge flags come out at weird times in the nfl it seems yes. to me yeah yes uh so in college you know it's it's usually like an analyst or somebody in the box like are they actually did you only get so many headsets are they actually on the headset different guys prioritize it in 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 different ways but ultimately every coach will tell you that like their main job during the game is to manage the game and that's that's a big that's a big part of it. Do you think there was a play in like football history that changed all that, Reese? Like, do you think there was a like a like a paradigm shift there? Or do you think it's been gradual? I feel as if it's been gradual. I can't recall off the top of my head any particular play that says, well, there you go. That's why yeah. you can't score. I'm sure there have been many. And in this era of offensive football, in which the rules are uh, particularly in the NFL, but also in college, in which the rules are geared a little bit more toward the offense, maybe maybe that's come into play with that too. Because it's really hard it's really hard to stop teams. I mean, you and I were watching uh, Oklahoma Texas, and everything for Oklahoma in the second half it seemed to me not that they didn't move the ball, but it seemed as if everything was hard. You know, mm -hmm. it was like a real struggle, you know, to kind of get things going. And then that last drive, all of a sudden it wasn't. And, you know, I think the default answer is, you know, defense is playing conservatively or, or whatever it might be. And there's and there's some truth to that. But I think some of it, too, is probably 
just the human nature. The defense knows now, okay, I can't let him behind me. I'm, you know, yeah, and there's just that little split second of hesitancy sometimes that gives the advantage to the offense. So, you know, I, I probably need to l- let this one go before I talk myself into taking the other side. <laughs> So it depends on your philosophy. What do you coach? What do you teach? What do you believe? And if you believe, wait, line up, field goal. I, I'm I'm always in favor of whatever your philosophy is as a coach and as a program. Adhere to that and don't be swayed. Uh, you're always you always set that philosophy within the guidelines and parameters of time and score, but don't be overly swayed because of you know of what might be happening in the game do do what you do what you believe in you know the the one too and i'll leave it with this on the football aspect of it there are guys who'd rather run out the clock and i've seen i've seen guys with an opportunity to go in and make it a two possession game and still maybe there's a minute and they don't even want to risk the touchdown onside kick recovery i'm always in favor if you go in and you can make it a two possession game you need to go in because, I mean, eliminate the possibility of disaster. You know, mm-hmm. the drop snap, the scoop and score, the Miami, Georgia Tech uh, disaster, the old, you know, we've referenced this more in the last two podcasts and it's been referenced in the last 20 years, but the UNLV Baylor disaster at the end in 99. So, um, but anyway, do what you can to take disaster out of the equation. That's that's yeah. basically my belief. What do you think about, what do you think about our trip to Seattle this weekend? I'm I'm really excited not only for the scene. It'll be dark uh, on the campus of Washington before we start. That's always great fun. We're going to have an unbelievable crowd from what I hear. We've got a really cool scene set, which is the opening of the show planned. We'll see how all of that unfolds. There's some uh, high wire technology involved in it. We're going to set the stage beautifully. This feels like a playoff game to me. It does not feel like an elimination game to me. And we did a we did our first college football playoff top twenty five show last night, and one mm-hmm. of the graphics that our research people put up was that the Pac twelve only has a three percent chance, according to one of those playoff predictor things, of getting two teams in the playoff, which is at the bottom. I, I I'm not seeing that to me because I feel like if Washington Oregon split, and certainly USC still in the mix, if those if those two split, any combination of splits with two great games, I think you have a tremendous opportunity. Uh, for more than one, depending on what happens elsewhere, but for more than one team from the Pac-12 to get into the playoff. Yeah. And I think right now that the Big 12 with Oklahoma winning is a little more vulnerable for a playoff spot. And I mean, Oklahoma was good. They've been great. They deserve all the credit for winning that game. They are not infallible, right? Like, so they, they could you know, step on a proverbial rake to use your parlance um, in, in the upcoming weeks. They are not going to dominate the rest of the Big 12, right? That's just, I think that's just fair. So if they if they get a loss and then lose to Texas on the back end, um, and then Texas picks up a loss somewhere, which again, Texas, human nature has always been Texas's biggest opponent in Big 12 play um, when they're not playing Oklahoma. And this Texas team is certainly susceptible to, uh, to that. And we saw some of their foibles on Saturday. So- Long way to say, I agree with you. I think the winner of this game has an inside track at the playoff with a lot of work to do. I do think there's a lot more potholes in the Pac-12 than in most years. Because let's not think for a second Washington State can't jump up and beat somebody. USC can beat anybody, and they could get they could give up 70 to anybody too. Um, Zachariah Branch is back. Um, he's been practicing this week. I don't want to declare him back yet, but when he does get back and it sounds like it will be, you know, a matter of, 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 of weeks here. Um, if it's not Notre Dame this week, that offense and those special teams hit a different gear. And just cause USC's defense statistically stinks doesn't mean they can't beat Oregon or Washington because they could just certainly run, run by guys. Um, I will say, and we can dive in the exit nose later. I got a big, uh, big personnel scout, uh, opposing coach, uh, thing coming this weekend, Reese. It's very interesting for this game and instructive for the future that both of these programs biggest weaknesses personnel wise are in the secondary Washington after years of churning out elite DBs elite DBs three and some draft they're just okay back there they're just okay they're not you know nope they're they're middle of the road below pac 12 and in Oregon's the same they're they're just all right um 
you know, teams felt like they could exploit their nickel, uh, who has had some good games. He played well against Stanford, uh, Nico Reed. But there's just – there's not um, – there's not a ton. Uh, the, the Alabama transfer for Oregon, Kyrie Jackson, has played well, and he's a guy that scouts like because he's 6'3 and is going to run well. But there aren't. Uh, there's no Christian Gonzalez or Trent McDuffie in those secondaries. And you've got some snipers at QB now, not only in this game but down the line. So that was one thing um, that I found interesting is that we could, we could really be seeing – 42 38 on Saturday from talking to the coaches who played them and the scouts who've gone through there. Best in game is brought to you by old dominion freight line, helping the world keep promises. And there are uh, many promises of just a fantastic showdown game between Washington and Oregon this weekend. And it's real, you mentioned the snipers at quarterback and it's sort of interesting the way both of them go about their business in many ways. Uh, Bo Nix with the 80% completion percentage, a lot of their stuff would sort of be a modern extension of the running game because there are a lot of passes that are completed at the line of scrimmage behind it within five yards and so forth. Penix throws the ball down the field. His air yards per attempt is almost double uh, that of Bo Nix on the season. Uh, Penix over 10 yards every time he uh, throws the ball or, you know, on average. And Nix is about a little over five and a half yards every time he throws the ball. Uh, they're combining to score 98 points a game. The interesting thing I think that will be, and, and you mentioned them being just okay in the secondary, is is the fact that you know Oregon's defense up to this point in the season ranks very highly in a lot of statistical categories. They certainly haven't seen an offense like this. Uh, they've also run the ball extraordinarily well, and even when you remove the Portland State game from their numbers, they would still it would take them down almost a yard per rush um, per carry, but they would still be leading the nation in yards per rush. Um, so it's going to be, I think that's going to be, that's going to be a thing right now is to see if Washington can stop their running game because the Huskies, they've, they've given, they'll give up a little bit uh, in the run too. I think it's over half of their carries have gone for, you know, four yards or more as sort of a benchmark of, you know, whether you can move the chains and control the ball. So there are so many statistical matchups that are fascinating in this game, yet they can be slightly misleading because the level of competition not that it, well, it has been bad. They're both below 100 in strength of schedule, but it, they haven't faced elite competition on the other side of the ball, save maybe uh, Colorado skill people against Oregon. But then that was such a mismatch on the line of scrimmage. Colorado didn't have a chance to see if that was going to work anyway. Yeah, I would say Texas Tech has pretty good skill, and that's they kind of they fair. had their they yeah. had their way. You know, what I mean, Te you you remember that game? I'm sure Texas Tech should have won that football game. Yeah, right? they gave up. The, I think Oregon gave up 30 points in that game too, and and yes. the turnovers killed. I think yes. it was three interceptions, yes. right? That yeah. shot through. Yeah. Now, all credit to Oregon going on the road. I think Tech had a 23 game win streak, so this isn't you know this is this isn't that that is a difficult place to play. And I think they're down nine in the fourth. I think they might have scored like 20 points in the fourth. Like they really stormed back. So all credit to them for doing it. But I think that game exposed, you know, some potential vulnerabilities. Now that's game two for Oregon. One was Portland. Your starters only playing 30 snaps or whatever. Right. So you got a lot of new guys, got a lot of transfers um, on, on, you know, on defense, especially uh, Jackson. They obviously have uh, Birch from South Carolina who really hasn't done a, done a ton. I will say this Reese. I probably talked to, six scouts and opposing coaches and every single one of them made some reference to Jordan Birch, who's the DN transfer on Oregon as an Adonis, a Tarzan, uh, like he, this guy must be the best looking player on the hoof, like in college football this year, because yeah, someone was like, he's the guy Nike should use to fit the uniform because he looks so good coming off the bus. <laughs> now he hasn't played great to be honest with you, but I'm looking forward to seeing him on the, on the sideline on, uh, on, on Saturday. Um, yeah, I think to to rewind back to the to the quarterbacks a little bit, I think it's an interesting debate of which one would you take, right? Um, the best Knicks comp I got from an NFL scout was they said he's like a better Desmond Ritter. He's an athlete. He can run. He can hurt you with his legs. Super high character. Desmond Ritter was like all-time great kid. Um, you know, second round-ish like skill set. Good passer. And good quarterback, but not like overly polished downfield. Um, 
Penix is pretty unique, right? First of all, he's left-handed. So your your comps, he is left-handed, right? He Yes, he's yeah. left-handed. LC's going to love that. Because remember, he was all over Dylan Gabriel last That's week. That's right. Left-handed That's right. quarterback. Yes. And he has a kind of a funky delivery, but it's the ball flies out. Like, they're just like when you watch it, it's not conventional and it's not like crafty Caleb Williams arm angle, Quinn Ewer's arm. It's just kind of a funky arm angle. Like, like that's sort of like the, the default of it. But that said, um, he has some obnoxious hand size that the NFL scouts are excited about. So we have our first hand size reference on the pod. If you picked, uh, <laughs> if you had the over under on October 11th of a hand size reference, but I guess he has monster mitts. Which matters, um, especially if you're going to be hucking it there. He's he's going to be 24 by the draft or right around the draft. He's had two ways. He's just an interesting – like, there aren't a lot of guys who followed his career path. Um, and I'll wrap up the – and I like Penix. I'll be, I'll be really honest. Like, that Cal game – if you watch that Cal game and you don't like Michael Penix, I mean, he was throwing dimes, like, opposite hash, 40 yards, well-covered back – I mean, he was, you know, he was dealing in uh, – in, in that game. Um, I think I made this point on the pod in the summer when we did our Pac-12 preview, but I think it's worth uh, rejuvenating. He took two downtrodden programs and made them like real high-end viable for their history. So he took Indiana in that COVID year um, to be, you know, the best Indiana season in a long, long time. And quite frankly, Michael Penix made Tom Allen a lot of money, a lot, a lot of money. And then Washington was dismal under Jimmy Lake in his last year. Like it was a, it was a no brainer to fire him and he shows up and he pulls them all the way. And again, Washington's had great teams. I'm not saying this is the greatest Washington team ever, but it's the best Washington team, at least since 2016, but he's pulled them right into the playoff conversation. I, I think they should be, you know, if you're, if I was mocking a playoff today, I would put them in. So credit to Michael Penix. That's hard to do to take two, two different programs and lift them to uh, historic anomalies. One of the notes I have, Pete, for the Indiana-Michigan prep on Saturday is that this might be historically, and trust me, I'm pulling this back to Michael Penix, as you can probably guess, historically, Indiana-Michigan is the biggest mass mismatch college football could ever come up with. Sure. Michigan has more wins than any program in college football history. Indiana has more losses. Michigan has 11 national championships. Indiana has zero. Michigan has 44 Big Ten titles. Indiana has two. Indiana once lost 24 consecutive games to Michigan until Michael Penix threw for 342 and three touchdowns with his offensive coordinator, Kalen DeBoer, in 2019. There's a little tie to another game. Between if you were to hear that on game day on Saturday, <laughs> there's a really, really good chance. See, this is foreshadowing. The podcast becomes foreshadowing. The other thing I want to show is from Bo Nick's standpoint, because, you know, we talk a lot about touching the crowd. And I think you can take Indiana, Michigan, Auburn, LSU, and you can touch the crowd with the, yay, there's Michael Penix in Indiana. We still love him. And boo, there's Bo Nix at Auburn, and we still don't like him because he's wearing Oregon green. Remember that of all the of all the crazy carnival ride moments that Bo had at Auburn, probably that scramble in 2021 against LSU. They were behind. I think they were behind 13 or nothing. He had this wild scramble. He had a couple of them, but there was one particular one and made a play, and they ended up coming back to coming back to win the game. So he, all of these quarterback transfers, the tentacles go out into other parts of the country in their former stops, too. Well, you remember who uh, immortalized Mario Cristobal's third worst clock management blunder? Blunder. It was Bo Nix's first Bo Nix, game. Right? Yeah, it yeah. was Bo Nix. Uh, he led them down the field at the end, and Oregon blew that pretty hefty lead they had. I think they were up like twenty-one nine or something like that in the in the fourth, and it was Bo Nix with nine seconds left who uh, who threw a touchdown pass and. Uh, yeah, Auburn somehow won in very Malzanian fashion, right? Like he <laughs> certainly found a way to find himself. Now he lost to quite a few of those games too. Let's be let's be real. But um, yes, that was uh, it. Was fun to sort of reminisce that in the uh, as things wove through uh, Mario's woes this week. That was a, that was an interesting game to uh, to reflect back on. Mario's woes might be a little bit more obvious this week with Drake May and North Carolina waiting. Um, you know of my affinity for Drake May's ability. I don't think he's he's 
played up to his capabilities consistently this year. Thrown a few more interceptions, missed a few balls here and there. But man, oh man, was he good Saturday. I mean, Tez Walker's numbers in and of themselves were pretty pedestrian. Mm -hmm. And by the way, he missed him badly. Oh, on on the crosser. Wide open, yeah, wide open touchdown. He had Adam. But but he still threw for four bills. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, his third 400-yard passing game. And I have to imagine that Walker's presence certainly helped them, even if the numbers were pedestrian. And so now Miami, Miami has its hands full, I think, with coming off that, trying to get themselves back emotionally. And Tyler Van Dyke struggled the other night, even though they should have won the game. And you best not struggle um, on offense because you're going to have to keep up with North Carolina on most stages, I believe. You know what stat blew me away, Reese? Uh, Crystal Ball's 0-5 in ACC home games. Yeah, isn't that He's weird? not won an ACC home game. Now, look, it's not like they play in some snake pit, right? Like, it's, uh, you know, it's a uh, classic pro city, passive, you know, whatever, 20 miles from campus crowd. But, like, the ACC, after one and two, aren't very good. So you would just think, and I don't know what the five are off the top of my head, you would just think they would have got somebody at home, right? It's hard to win on the road. Miami's had some decent players. So that number was almost like, and that's what happens when you have a blunder like that is all of a sudden everything you've done comes into focus and they take a, you take a referendum on everything you do. You want a little food for thought before our Friday podcast and making picks? Miami is Miami is one and five against the spread following a straight up loss under Cristobal. And they're one and eight against the spread in ACC play under Crystal Ball, and that's the worst cover percentage in the ACC during that time since he's been head coach. Yeah, that is who we thought. It's also interesting, and again, we could we this is like a borderline hijack, but like it's interesting that uh, point spreads are based on perception, right? Like there is like the reality is who you think is going to win, but it's also where the money is going to go. And I feel like old Northeast money still follows Miami the same way it follows Notre Dame. Does that make sense? Yeah. So those lines might be a little bit skewed. Now that said, they look, they just haven't been very good. They're more talented. I still think for Miami to be a legitimate like ACC contender, they're a good year away. And they're probably gonna find another quarterback um to do it, which is not a sure, which is not a sure thing. So yeah, it's uh they they're they're much better on the offensive line. There's areas there's improved, the talent is better, but um you know, it's a great test of where that program is between between the helmet holes right now, right? Like, are they aligned? Are they bought in? Are they distracted? Like, you know, like they're, they're, it, it will be very interesting to see when, you know, how they react when that first pass gets batted down on third and six and they three and out and like, you know, can they respond on the road? I would imagine Keenan Stadium is going to be as lively as it's been in a few years. That is certainly... Um, I picked on the Carolina fans a little bit this year, but that's certainly a wine and cheese crowd normally. Like, I wonder if it's going to be a little bit more jacked up because they can they, they can taste another level of of success there. And it's also a good test for North Carolina, Pete, to see if they can get there and not shrink away from the moment because Correct. this is a, a pretty sizable moment for them because they, as it stands right now, there's a scenario in which some – power five conference champion gets left out of the playoff. But the overwhelming likelihood is if North Carolina wins the rest of its football games, they're going to the playoff. That's the likelihood. That means they would be undefeated ACC champion. Um, A lot of ground to cover before they can get there. But that's the level that you're talking about. That is there for the taking if they are good enough to take it. And if they can step into this moment and a moment like this means that you take care of a reeling Miami team at home. You get them coming to your place. You got your receiver back. You got an all-world quarterback. You win the game. No, no questions asked. And you win it. You know, I'm not talking blowing them out, but you leave no doubt that you're the better team. If North Carolina is going to be that at the end of the game against Miami, we don't need to say they escaped. Good for Carolina. They still have the zero in the loss column. If North Carolina is a legitimate contender, then they leave no doubt at the end of the game that they're the better team. And that's a pretty good measuring stick for the Tar Heels under Mac Brown uh, come Saturday. I thought it was instructive that uh, Mac texted Kirk when Pat McAfee mentioned Florida State and Miami as AC contenders and and not Mac. I thought that was a little window. Look, 
these coaches are all wonderfully thin skinned, right? And this is not picking on Mac. They all are all 130. So, but for Mac to kind of be like, Hey, why aren't we in there? I think to me, it was a window into what he feels like his team's reality is right. Because if you think you have a five and O paper tiger, that's about to collapse. I don't think you draw attention on yourself in that way. Right. So I thought that was a, that was a telling moment where Mac likes his Mac, like Mac peaked as peaked at his poker cards at the table. He likes his hand. <laughs> Speaking of coaches in thin skin, did you see did you see James Franklin's reaction to to the question yesterday about taking shots down the field? I, I don't really understand what you're saying because we would never like I'm like my skin is curling when you say just drop back and chuck it deep no matter what like like that is like I, I don't even know what you're I don't know what you're saying. The reason I, I bring it up is because it talking about Mac and and coaches reacting in certain ways to question. Now, let, me, let me point out, all of us, you, I, I imagine you have, I don't know, I've never seen you do this. I know that I have. You have phrased a question poorly. Oh, yeah. You, did, you, sure. didn't, you didn't get your meaning across. Yeah. What the guy, and the guy apparently had to deal with uh, some ridiculous threats on sure. Twitter, you know, from, yeah. which is preposterous, but that's a, a different rant for a different day. What he was getting at is Penn State has one 40-yard pass play all season. It's toward the bottom of the nation. They only have five 30-yard pass plays. That also is toward the bottom of the nation. What he was getting at was, you know, do you get Drew Aller to take a shot or whatever every now and then? How do you do that? And the, and the question, I'm not going to defend him because I don't like it when media guys run just to defend someone because they're another media guy. He he knows he could have done a better job with the question. He's owned that. We And we've all made similar mistakes you know and james seized on an off-ramp you know the great interviewing guru john sawatsky talks about being careful not to give the person you're asking questions to an off-ramp so that you get him to answer the question that you really want answered i did that with mac brown once um and you know i hope i actually hope that james calls this guy and that they straighten things out i sort of suspect that he might but I was asking Mac a question about some disciplinary issues that they had had at Texas. And my, my intent of the question, Pete, was to praise him because I've forgotten who the player was, but they were suspending a significant player for a real game, you know, in, in tech uh, at Texas or had done so. But in phrasing the question, I probably didn't make the question lean enough. I went into too much background, hoping to benefit the audience. And I, and I referenced a wrong time frame, like rather than from the start of the year, I maybe I referenced start of last season. Whatever I did, I referenced the wrong time frame, which made the number of players who got in trouble, you know, erroneous. It was right in the right time frame. Max seized on that and kind of, you know, went after me pretty good, and it completely derailed the interview. All right. Uh, both ways. And it was uh, on, I think it was on college football line. And so afterwards, you know, I, I called up Mac and I said, look, I said, I just want you to know that wasn't, I said, my mistake. I gave you the wrong time frame. It's all on me. I said, but I did want you to know the intent of my question. The intent of my question was to praise you, but because I made the mistake and there, you thought that I was setting up a gotcha question. Why are so many of your guys getting in trouble? I said, and Mac, to his credit, always a gentleman, you know, we've totally, you know, it was totally fine with it. But it's a great example of how these guys, uh, I guess, under the pressure, James Franklin knows they haven't made big plays in the passing game. And he knows he ought to answer questions about it. But there was a little off ramp there and he seized on it and uh, wonderfully thin skinned, as you put it, uh, sort of shown through. Maybe because he's thinking about what they have coming up next week when they go to Ohio State. Reese, Sally, and I, Sally, and I listened to your question again on College Football Live, and and, and Sally and I, we, we determined that you know it was a fair question. You had, you had facts wrong, Reese, but uh, we we respect you, ESPN, a uh, good worldwide leader in the people of Bristol. Oh man, that's pretty good. But you know, I think the thing is, and I hope you know. Look, I'm not going to sit here and try to get into the middle. I don't know the reporter who asked the question at all. Um, you know, I know James, obviously. And, They'll probably make it right. It's not a big deal. These things come up mid-October. People get a little tired. Skin gets even a little bit thinner on both sides, both media and coaches. Things come up. It happens. We're at the point in the season, Reese, where the novelty of it starting is worn off and the ending is not in sight. 
So <laughs> now it's a beautiful place for a fan. It's not a complaint, but you're in like the, you're just kind of in the, in the, what do they call it? The dog days of like, all right. Yeah. People are tired. People are a little thin skinned. People are where they are, but I, yeah, I, uh, and that's that's no criticism of 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 James. Like I, I, you know, I can understand both sides there. It was it was a clunky question. There was there uh, no, was there was no doubt about it. Unequivocally yeah, I, a clunky question. Yeah, now and, and I wanted to point out that because I don't didn't want to make it seem like I was yeah. blasting this guy. All of us, if you do this yes. long enough, you're yeah. going to uh, inartfully ask a question. You're not going to quite get at the meaning. I think you know as I put on my. Uh, I love to reference John Sawatsky. I put on my Sawatsky hat. He probably made a couple of missteps and then he probably tried to make it a little too casual and probably tried to uh, try a little too hard to show that he knew something that he was talking about. But then he was able because it wasn't quite artful, as artful as he would have hoped. It, it hit James as a big criticism instead of, you know, instead of a question about, you know, what could Drew Aller do better? How do you coach him, uh, you know, in terms of when he has one-on-one, -on -one, you know, to try to throw it to the back shoulder, to try to give his receiver a chance. And, you know, it just got got a little sideways. It happens. Like this podcast sometimes yeah. gets a little sideways. You had uh, James Swatsky formal training. I had uh, informal reps with Jim Beheim. Well, that's not a stupid question, is that? <laughs> Instant feedback makes you get him a little more tight. Yeah, may, maybe so. But <laughs> having dealt with Beheim a fair amount myself, they're basically a stupid question is one that Jim would prefer not to answer. <laughs> yes, that's that, that, is, that is a very accurate <laughs> summation. <laughs> oh, man. But I will say this. Beheim is one of the more straightforward guys that I've ever run across in coaching. He'll you know, he'll come, he'll come right out and tell you if he thinks something's BS that you said, if you've been critical of him and he agrees with you or of his team, he will tell you that too. And I've, I've, I've always, I've always enjoyed Jim. Like the the guys I don't like are the one game at a time mumble, like, yeah, you know, yeah. like, let's not say anything interesting. Jim Bam is saying some interesting stuff like that's And I, I always enjoyed covering for that. And when I became a national reporter I would often call him because he'd have a take. And it would it would not be a conventional take, which is good. Like you you don't want just choir people singing in the choir of uh, of the mainstream. I see that Notre Dame's a favorite. USC creates some negative plays. Notre Dame against the better competition, certainly not implying that USC's defense is great competition, and they give up a ton of yards. But Notre Dame hasn't scored recently, and I don't care who you are. If you're playing SC, you're going to have to put numbers on the board. And I'm not sure Notre Dame can do it, uh, you know, because I, I'm just not sure they can. I know, I know they'll score more than they have the last couple of games against SC's defense, but I'm, I'm not convinced that, uh, that Notre Dame can keep up Saturday night. What do you think? Let's let's bring Bill Connolly, Reese. Um, I'm sure Bill has uh, dedicated a lot of time and numeric uh, numeric calculation to to, to this game, and um, it's an interesting matchup, Bill, because it's a really really woeful defense having to play a uh, fairly impotent offense. And I'd be curious, just when you have those types of matchups, typically who who ends up usually coming out on the on the on the better. Um, I, I've never picked up on a trend. I'd like to say offense um, because I like points, but I'm not real sure. I think what's going to be really interesting about this game is the tempo more than anything, because this is a, um, you know, neither team really employs all that much tempo. Uh, USC is kind of average in that regard, but I mean, Notre Dame held Ohio state to what was it like eight drives um, really kind of just dictated how that game was going to play out. And I think that might be the most important thing it is. I mean, USC basically on defense, will say like, okay, we're going to give you some big plays. We're going to try to, you know, force some negative plays and, and, and all that, but we're going to, we're willing to risk giving you some big plays because we know we're going to score points. Um, and Notre Dame has absolutely just said, no, 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 no. We don't need big plays. It's fine. We're not going to make any whatsoever over the last four games um, or three games, I guess. And something's got to give in that regard. Uh, that was the biggest thing early in the season 
Notre Dame was making more 30, 40 yard gains than anybody. They were scoring 40 plus every single game, but they only played one good defense in that span. Um, and it was an NC state team that just gave up a bunch of points to Marshall. So how good that defense is, we're not sure. Um, and now they've played three straight top 20 teams and our top 20 defenses in terms of uh, SP plus, and they've gotten just nothing, absolutely nothing easy on, on, on offense. So confidence is, is waning. I thought they just looked tired for a couple of weeks now, you know, they started the season in Ireland in week zero and haven't had a week off yet. Um, so this does feel tough. I know why, I mean, I know why Notre Dame's, co- uh, favored because i mean usc's barely beaten colorado and arizona state the last couple of weeks and and really didn't look good against arizona state the week before that so they uh, you know their offense is fantastic but they still haven't really looked all that together um but i i certainly lean usc myself i think two these, these are two good teams right i i you know look usc hasn't lost yet which i think gets lost that gets lost in a little bit of the the discourse because their defense has been so dismal. So I'm not so naive to say I think USC is some sort of national championship contender or playoff shoe in, but I don't think until they lose, we can we can discount them only because this is the only way Lincoln Riley has ever won. He has never won playing complimentary football. He has won by going 100 miles an hour and having some poor defensive coordinator hold on by his fingernails. Um uh, it was interesting that he uh, he really you know, stood on the table for Alex Grinch and, uh, you know, pointed out that there were, you know, significant improvements in that, uh, you know, in the USC defense this year. They did not play uh, with Damani Jackson, who's their best corner last week. He is going to be back this week. Uh, Christian Roland Wallace is uh, uncertain right now, as is Zachariah Branch. So uh, Christian Roland Wallace is, is one of their uh, one of their mainstream corners Um who, you know, you would think they would need, they they would want and need to have back because they were playing with a host of backups by the time uh, that Arizona game ended the other day through a variety of injuries and and attrition. So I am, uh, and and look, Zachary Branch gives you a definitive edge in the third phase, right? There's no special teams demon like him in college football. So it will be anyone... Any interested investors in this game, I would I would pay close attention going up to kick because there are some there are some big names and key pieces here um, who we who we need to pin down whether they're playing or not. Notre Dame's offensive line, in my judgment, hasn't played up to its reputation. And Bear Alexander, for all of the trouble that the SC defense has had, largely has. I'm really I'm really interested to see. If, if Notre Dame wants to employ the tactic that they have, if, as we talked about Monday, if they decide who they are is feeding the ball to Audric Estime, can their offensive line answer the challenge? Can they keep Alexander from living in the backfield? And can they control the game? And, you know, this is a season-swinging game for both teams, obviously for Notre Dame because it potentially would be its third loss. But also for USC, because if Notre Dame, coming off the loss to Ohio State and the way that happened, and coming off the beatdown at the hands of Louisville, even if you believe Washington and Oregon are the best teams in the Pac-12, if Notre Dame beats USC, the Pac-12 takes a little bit of a perception hit because of that. And, And then maybe what we're seeing in, in the Pac-12 instead of being like, I feel like it is right now, that I feel like the Pac-12 is really, really good, maybe I'd say, okay, well, they just got a lot of similar teams. You know, I still think Washington and Oregon are elite and the most balanced teams. I think USC, because of its offense, still could get there and, and make it into the playoff. But this is a really big game for the perception of both teams. And the, uh, and the irony is, is that Notre Dame, a few times this season has tried to play with 10 players. And as it turns out, so did USC a couple of times Saturday night, <laughs> even though I think Lincoln Riley got the timeouts called just in time to keep them from actually having to do it. But they, there have been, there have been uh, organizational errors for, uh, for both of these teams that have been pretty well documented. Yeah. You used a great phrase Reese uh, to talk about Auburn the other day, uh, the Georgia game there, you called it a haunted house. Yep. Well, certainly like Notre Dame Stadium, you'd be a haunted house. So Caleb Williams in the haunted house is a really cool notion. You you know, we've all been at Notre Dame for those games when this, oh, is it a primetime game? Are they prim- yeah. They're, they're primetime. Okay. 
you got the you know usually it's the the two thirty game and the the lights are dimming and it's a, it's such a such a fun environment there. But I'm curious to see Caleb Williams on that stage. I'm also curious to see the Notre Dame offensive line. They are Mel Kiper All Stars or Matt Miller All Stars right now. They have not played to their summer hype. And if you can't push that USC front around, you know they're, they're, there's going to and you can't convert third and twos. Um, when anyone and everyone has pushed USC's front around, I think we're going to have, uh, you know, I think that's a that's an indictment on uh, on on that Notre Dame front not maximizing, which clearly some physical raw talent. So I just looked it up. Uh, USC has underachieved my SP plus projections by an average of seventeen points per game over the last three games. Um, they, they, I said Notre Dame needs a bye week. That coming off of their bye week, USC still kind of on their bye week apparently. Um, and the defense has been responsible for most of that. They've underachieved also by 17 points a game. I think I talked to Kevin Wilson a few years ago after his Indiana experience uh, when he was head coach there. And he he talked about like just n- taking forever to figure out, you know, he's like, I know I knew how to create a good offensive culture because I am an offensive guy, never figured out how to create a good defensive culture. And if if Lincoln Riley is vigorously defending Alex Grinch and talking about significant improvement when they're 73rd in points allowed per drive and uh, 64th in success rate, that's absolutely improvement. That is not significant at all and not nearly good enough. And if he's still thinking, if he thinks that's, that's great and everything's trending in the right direction when you've got four and five star talent everywhere, like that's, kind of a lost cause uh he he has not figured out what he needs to figure out about defensive football at this point so we'll we'll see he's kind of the, the anti he's like the reverse mark d'antonio in that regard he thinks every defense stinks because he can beat any defense and therefore he doesn't know how to create a good one and um <laughs> i it's it's holding them back because i mean now that they're notre dame's 12th and sp plus they're trending in the wrong direction but they're still 12th utah's 25th washington's sixth oregon's fifth ucla's 16th uh, if they continue to underachieve and if they continue to regress defensively as they have the last few weeks, like seven and five is as likely as 12 and zero at this point. And um, I, I, we'll, we'll see. Both of these teams have a ton to prove. You, you had an interesting take. You were talking about quarterbacks who are built for this time of year, built for the uh, championship chase. I know they're off this week. What did you mean by that when you were looking at Dylan Gabriel of Oklahoma? Yeah, I just find it really interesting. I mean, he seems to like the bigger games he's played, the better he's played. Um, And that's really kind of interesting to me uh, for obvious reasons, I guess. But also just, uh, I mean, the the well-roundedness of the OU offense at this point um, is is pretty intriguing as well. Like they just lost their their number one yards guy and Andre Anthony. And you can't really say... I mean, it'll hurt. Like you want all your best players available for big games, but um, I mean, Drake Stoops has been as important, even if he's more of a possession, you know, uh, like nine yards per catch guy, but Jalil Farouk's averaging 21 yards a catch. Nick Anderson's averaging 26 yards a catch. He's distributing the ball everywhere. um, And everybody's producing for him right now. That was the big OU's receiving core was a big thing. um, A big question mark for me heading into the year. And and kind of a whole bunch of guys are producing, and and that's pretty exciting. So I think um, it w- it was interesting watching too, like Dylan Gabriel. He's not going to run much over the next six weeks. They're probably not going to need just a ton of help uh, over the next few weeks. They're they're going to be double digit favorites for a while here, except maybe against Kansas actually, which is funny to say. But um, like I, I don't I, think they'll was... be double digit favorites at Kansas. Well, that's it, it, that's why right now, like yeah. I, with SP Plus, they're like at ten point seven in okay. that game. I could see that getting yeah into single, but if otherwise, Jalen Daniels mean, is back or not would probably swing that right. line by two three points. Yeah. yeah, but otherwise, I mean, I, I'm looking at like fourteen points against UCF, fourteen against OSU, twenty four percent chance of getting to twelve and zero right now. And um, when in doubt, we we've seen now that they'll they'll run him um, selectively probably, but. He can run, and that made the the difference in the Texas game, and and it'll be really interesting to see, you know, in, in the rematch how that goes, I guess. But no, I, I just he's he's passed every test. Dylan Gabriel's passed every test that he's been given this year, and he was really good last year too. But they lost a bunch of close games, so kind of got lost a little bit. Um, he he proved a lot, I think, on Saturday. And I don't, I'm certainly not trying to take over as host here, but we we had <laughs> dove in on Washington, Oregon a little bit uh, earlier in the podcast. 
do you have a, a, a does anything jump out at you about uh, about that 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 game? We we sort of marveled at the quarterbacks, cringed at the secondaries. Um, anything uh, anything that jumped out at you numbers wise there? Yeah, numbers wise, I think my biggest question is um, Oregon is pretty much easily a number one in basically all my major rushing categories. Um, Russian success rate, Russian marginal explosiveness is my kind of the measure of when you have a successful play, how big is it? They're number one in that. They're number one in like percentage of carries gaining four yards. Um, they are dynamite on the ground. Uh, Washington is 50th in rushing success rate, uh, 107th, uh, like uh, 51% of, of carries are gaining at least four yards on Washington. That's 107th. They're 117th in stuff rate. They're not, they're not really doing anything disruptive to the opponent's run game. And to me, um, I mean, Washington kind of has similar advantages against the Oregon run defense, but Washington doesn't run the ball. Uh, Oregon will. And um, that to me is, is kind of the number one question until we see that Washington can slow down a really, really good Oregon attack uh, run game. I don't know if anything else matters. Obviously, Washington's going to score points. They're both going to score points. Uh, but it feels like that might be something that Oregon can just dictate the entire game with uh, until we see that Washington has a little push there. You Do you worry about Bo Nix at all because of ability to make a big play? Now, I, I do remember last year we had a lot of these similar stats as an Oregon offensive philosophy that so many passes at the line of scrimmage within yep. five yards. We were saying a lot of these things before Oregon played UCLA last year, and Bo hit him with a couple of big plays down the field. Yeah, Would, that's. Do you see? Do you see Oregon maybe looking for those types of opportunities Saturday, to proving they can do it and needing to do so if they're going to continue to run despite uh, some of the Washington rush defense numbers? Right. This isn't Penn State with their lack of explosiveness by any means. Um, we won't get back into that. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they have Troy Franklin, who uh, can go deep. Obviously, they don't do much of it, but he will go deep to Troy Franklin and Tess Johnson a little bit. Um, mostly intermediate routes with Johnson and mostly short routes with Franklin, but they'll still give it a shot. And so I'm not as worried about that with Penn State. It has been funny. They just don't do it. And and I was curious if that was a... Uh, just trying to keep things reined in for Aller or whether um, he's just not looking for the right shots or whatever. I think Bo will take it if it's there. And um, he just hasn't had to because they are so relentlessly efficient. They can run for six yards anytime they want to. They can throw for seven yards anytime they want to. Uh, and they just destroy you. Even going back to that Georgia game last year where they got uh, blown out, whatever it was, 49-3, they were still moving the ball to Georgia's midfield every single time. Um, they just weren't getting any further. Uh, most teams don't have Georgia's defense. Washington definitely doesn't have Georgia's defense. And um, I, I, I don't know. I'm not, this isn't a concern for me necessarily. What, which way are you leaning in that game, Bill? I, I can't get the run thing out of my head. I, I find myself leaning toward Oregon, but it is, I mean, SP plus says Washington by two, like right at the line. Um, it's basically, I mean, these two teams are so hilariously similar statistically that maybe it's just home field that pushes Washington over. I just, I think if there's any sort of matchup advantage to be gleaned, maybe that leans towards Oregon. Uh, Bill, last thing here before we uh, wrap up the pod, other than Oregon, Washington, which game this weekend is the one that has captured your attention <laughs> based on, based on your dive into the numbers, anything that we've missed here? Um, well, it is, uh, Obviously, the other big game is Miami, North Carolina. It's hard to even pretend or care about numbers in that one just because until Miami shows up, um, like nobody in the country, my editor said this uh, yesterday, so I'm stealing it. Nobody in the country loses a game twice like Miami does. And so, uh, and that, that may was get before. stolen on game day Saturday too. That's great. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and that's before, and it, in the, the times they suffer those uh, problems, it hasn't even been what Dan Levitard called the worst loss in program history. So uh, we'll see, like, I figure either they lose by 30 or they go all the way in the other direction and win by 30 stats are super interesting in this one. Lots of interesting matchups. I don't, I can't even pretend like any of it matters until we see if Miami shows up or not. So um, that one isn't really a stat thing. Honestly, I, this is a me thing probably, but, uh, the, the G five new year six race has two super, super interesting games Tulane at Memphis and Wyoming, Wyoming at air force. I'm going to watch, 
a ton of both of those. Uh, Tulane Memphis is on Friday night too. Um, I, that game, I think SP Plus has Memphis by 0.02 in that game. Wow. Uh, just a straight toss up. And uh, both teams have tons of athletes and really – the winner of that one is has the inside track at being the proverbial one loss AAC champion that uh, that usually gets in. But Air Force is unbeaten and might still be unbeaten, uh, you know, six seven weeks from now. And I would love to see, you know, congratulations Oklahoma or whoever for having a great season and making a New Year Six bowl. Now go play Air Force in the Fiesta Bowl. That's going to be a a nightmare for a big name team, and I love it. I, th- I don't think any program has been as consistently productive with different dudes as Air Force the last like five years and not gotten like the level of sort of Cinderella attention. I mean, they graduated kind of like a majority of their offense and they just like rolled a bunch of guys in and they had some early sputters this year. But whew, man, they can they can move that rock, man. They 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 figured out the blocking rules change didn't matter to them. They've just uh, they've they've rocked and rolled so. A lot of credit, a lot of credit to them. You will not get Reese to ever pick against Wyoming again. So I just want oh, to be man. clear about that. He, he is, he has like a brown mustard stain on his shirt in <laughs> in memorial to to help him remember to never pick against the Pokes. There are there aren't many uh, there aren't many people who you know can really pull off the brown suit, but you know Ronald Reagan did it. Wyoming does it. <laughs> kind of about at the end of it, I think. Yeah. I don't know that they're they're different in Laramie and away from it, right? But, but that number does that number seems seems a little big, uh, seems a little a little big. They still were, you know, they they had that hilarious ten minute drive against Texas, had them tied in the third quarter uh, in their one road game this year. So I really like my numbers are are have been slow to 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 grow on Wyoming. And I think it's because every game they're good at something a little different and and they do just enough regardless. But they've beaten Texas Tech in overtime. They've beaten App State with a late blocked field goal touch returned for a touchdown. They beat Fresno State with a big man INT at the end. Um it is it is so much fun watching them uh figure out ways. So either way, it, we're gonna win on this one. I just uh my vision of Air Force being in a New Year's Six Bowl and making somebody an absolute nightmare of a day. That's kind of controlling me at the moment. I'm rooting for the Falcons. Bill, just one small thing. Don't slight mustard. They had Texas tied That's, in the fourth quarter. Oh, as a fourth. Is that when the fourth run quarter. started? I remember the big drive was in the third quarter. Okay. Didn't, so didn't, it didn't until, take long. It didn't no. take long in the fourth quarter. They uh, I think it was worthy. Made a guy miss on a hitch and yeah. went to the house, and there was a pick six, and then it was kind of over. So, uh, but yeah. but they're delightful to watch this year. They really are. They're they're. I was I was watching them on the plane on my phone <laughs> after Red River last week. And by I mean, the way, there were like two other games on you should have been watching. <laughs> I know, but uh, it was super dog, and I was trying to whip them home. And when when Fresno State Tedford kicks the field goal and then recovers the onside kick, yeah. I'm like. I'm like, my man, Ted Head, I think I still have uh, one of those Ted Head tie-dye T-shirts from when he was at Cal. Yeah. Nope. Um, I was like, my man, Ted Head's going to mess this up for me. And he tried. He tried mightily. But uh, the powers of the brown suit in Laramie <laughs> came through finally at the end. So there you go. Bill, always a pleasure, my friend. Uh, your stuff on ESPN.com is phenomenal. I would be remiss if I didn't point out how much it helps me in my prep every week along with our conversation with you on a weekly basis. So keep up the good work and don't worry. Uh, Missouri, Missouri's fine. Yeah. Pro- pro- they just don't have Jaden Daniels. That was kind of their, uh, their primary issue last week. That, that false start was one of the, Oh, you know, like that's just one of those that Missouri is will haunt Missouri fans for years. Uh, my friend actually learned something interesting about me last week. Um, when Brady Cook got stripped uh, on that uh, after the the false start there, and then you know he gets the big sack and strip, and they lose twenty five yards or whatever. The um, as soon as that happened, I started and the ball was rolling backwards. I started calculating. Okay, if they recover this, what do they have to do? If LSU recover, can they force a field goal? Uh, and then like thirty seconds later, I, I I had forgotten what what happened with the fumble, and it was such a big. I thought it was a bad snap. Like I had already moved on, and I really freaked my friend out. I was like, "Was that a bad snap, or did Brady just not catch it right, or whatever?" He's like, "He got sacked." So, <laughs> um, so would I, you I, have I was punted little, there, Bill? I, well, because he gain, because they basically just looked like they were trying to gain yards and maybe spring one. I guess it had the same effect, but that was our thought at first. Was well, you kind of 
kind of have to punt now and take your chances. It worked out okay, um, but it was a it was a tall ass gaining twenty five yards or whatever that was on fourth down. Yeah, yeah. Just just curious. That's going to be that game against Kentucky. Both teams uh, on what Herb Street had dubbed Opportunity Saturday. Uh, <laughs> neither of which were able to come through. And now, sort of the perception yep. of where you are and where your season is going to go from here. Um, Missouri not at being state able to, with Missouri and Kentucky. Yeah, Missouri not being able to stop the run and Kentucky not being able to stop the pass. I don't. This is a weird game coming up too. I don't really know which way to lean on this one. Kentucky usually beats Missouri, so I guess that's the way to go. But uh, the matchups are interesting. We'll find out which way people are leaning on the next edition of the College Game Day podcast coming up Friday. Bill Connolly joining us. Bill, thanks as always. Pete and I will be back with. Uh, Steve Coughlin, affectionately referred to as Stanford Steve, to make some picks. Remember to subscribe to the podcast. That way you never miss a single episode and you're not late trying to scramble around and find it. Thanks for listening. We'll talk on Friday.